Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for our fourth session in our Hack to the Future series. I am your host Madeline Loveday, I'm an environmental specialist in the ESG team at Finastra. Um, before we start today's session, I just wanted to say that everyone in the ESG team and across Finastra are sharing their, their thoughts and their prayers with those that are affected by the current events taking place in Eastern Europe. Um, and we want to thank our colleagues who have really kindly and generously donated to Save the Children. So Hack to the Future is a fintech movement igniting a world of financial sustainability, inclusion and empowerment. Building on the success of our previous hackathons to redefine finance for good and build an unbiased fintech future, we continue to use our position in the market to inspire the fintech space to be open by default for everyone. This year, we aim to drive engagement beyond our global fintech ecosystem with three key themes that are inclusive and open to all. These are ESG, embedded finance and DeFi. Today, we're going to talk about sustainable and inclusive finance with a focus on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I'm really excited to welcome our two speakers, Jay Mookie, Finastra's ESG uh, Senior Director, and Clayton Ferraro, who's a biologist and also the Executive Director of Ideas for Us, who are a um, Finastra ESG partner. So to kick off, I'm going to go to Clay and I'm going to ask him to talk to us a little bit about ideas for us and uh, also explain what are the UN SDGs. Awesome, Maddie. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to get to share all about uh, ideas for us, but also perspectives in environmentalism. So uh, as you'll learn, uh, ideas for us is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Now, all that that means is that that's the type of business that we are in the United States. We actually started as a college club in a dorm room back in 2008 as a group of students that realized that we needed to stop just talking about the environmental problems, but do the really difficult work that it takes to actually solve them. So we knew that we needed to get active. We knew that advocacy, as important as it is, is in everything. Uh, I'm 35 years old. In, in my entire lifetime as a millennial, the narrative have, has always been, these are the environmental problems. Here is uh, all of the causes that they happen and the terrible things that will happen from uh, uh, us doing nothing. Young people are the future. Uh, it's up to you all. Good luck. And unfortunately, what that does is as empowering as it may seem, it actually creates people becoming apathetic or numb, checked out, depressed. Uh, there is this whole aspect of climate grief that is even something that was added to the dictionary uh, in the past few years to describe what happens when people feel powerless against these big global problems. So we knew that advocacy alone wasn't the route. We had to get active. And uh, as time went on, we started to spread across the United States at college uh, campuses. We did all different types of action projects, but we realized that we needed to kind of evolve as an organization and focus on the solutions. So Maddie, if you could just jump back one slide for just a moment. So in us focusing on these things, we realized that we wanted to develop ideas in communities, fund the local action that comes out of them, and then scale these different solutions to different places. The framework that we're able to use for this are these sustainable development goals, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But there's something that everyone here listening can implement into their own lives. Uh, and they're luckily things that some you know, uh, companies, big and small, are taking very seriously to Finaster being one of them. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that's important and has changed a little bit over time, for starters, we've been now doing action 14 years, so I've got to update this slide. But uh, what is cool is from this developing ideas, funding action, scaling solutions concept, we quickly saw the triple bottom line come into reality. And what the triple bottom line is, is it is at the heart of sustainability. Sustainability is uh, really this economic, social, and environmental aspect 
But we realized that in, in order to do that, we had to educate people, right, to make sure that they knew the, how the problem is affecting them. They know what the problems are in the environment, but they might not know how it's affecting them in their local community. And because they can't see that, they don't think it's important enough to take action on. <clears throat> so then we knew we had to engage people, engage them with action projects, engage them in think tanks, all those types of things. And then we also knew that people ultimately need jobs and career pathways. So employing people became tremendously important. Uh, I'm actually in Tallahassee right now, the state capital uh, of Florida. I wish I was in the Museum of Paris, which is what I have behind me there. Uh, but I'm in Tallahassee uh, working on uh, a bill that will focus on employing young people around sustainability, aquaculture, urban agriculture, and STEM-related technologies, solar, and all of these types of things like that. So working with local go governments to implement these UN SDGs is tremendously important. Bring them into their daily lives, their business practices, and their policies. Which really then brings us to <clears throat> what I think is just so key, <clears throat> and you'll hear how companies like Finaster are putting this into play when I pass it over to Jay here soon, but uh, the Sustainable Development Goals started as an idea, and that idea was, could we evolve past having the Millennium Development Goals, which make a clear separation between what's called North and South countries? Now, this has nothing to do with geography. The terminology actually comes from uh, how we look at people below the poverty rate, below a certain uh, you know, uh, level of uh, quality of life, below or unfortunately above the amount of diseases that they might be facing in particular places around the world. And these Millennium Development Goals kind of uh, pointed the finger and poo-pooed at these countries that are below the line. And that's not the way to create or stimulate change. What we really needed was global goals. And it was the country Colombia actually that proposed this back in 2012. I was at the meeting that it was proposed at in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil for the UN. And we had already made our own metrics framework as ideas for us, uh, but then we started to participate and to help craft uh, the rollout of these 17 goals that have 169 targets and over 250 indicators that coincide with them. So these are true KPIs to be able to pinpoint where a country is. But what many partners have done, like Ideas for Us, is dissect these, especially the environmental ones. Let's look at climate action. Let's look at life below water, uh, life on land, uh, even things like peace, justice, and strong institutions, SDG 16. Uh, is so tremendously key and um, especially in creating different types of laws that maybe stop things like illegal logging or wildlife trafficking or things that we're doing locally here in Orlando where I'm uh, where uh, our headquarters is in Orlando Florida uh, where we're trying to pass tree ordinances that protect trees and require if big ones are cut down to either try to save them relocate them not cut them down uh, but if they have to, then to propose a planting mitigation, uh, not for little sticks of trees, but as large a trees as we can come across and to uh, replant those. So each one of these things has was designed in mind for country level, but since then they've been engineered down and have become even more uh, important uh, at the local level, because that's one of the big takeaways I hope everyone gets here. You know, as we grew as an organization, we saw our original idea of localized action, right, to build this future that we want play out again and again and again. We've crash tested it now for 14 years and are yet to be wrong that local action has an extraordinary impact up the totem pole as opposed to down. Uh, and you know, certainly um, legislation and decisions made by countries' leaders, right, as we all know, have dire consequences uh, to, to those citizens. But people power is a very important part here, uh, fostering democracy and people coming together and assembling and talking about these kinds of things is so key. And that can happen inside of companies as well. Finaster has been one of our partners now, goodness, probably three years now. And uh, we've worked with them on a whole host of really cool projects that allow them to walk and talk this 
mentality of having these things be of value. And uh, certainly Jay will talk more on those things. Uh, before I turn it over, I just want to talk about, um, you know, my couple favorite SDGs that we work on here uh, at Ideas for Us. So certainly climate action is tremendously important. Uh, climate action reaches so deep into things like the transit sector, it deeps, it uh, reaches into finance. It reaches in. I mean, look at, for instance, the the carbon emissions of some uh, proof of work blockchain currencies. Uh, you know, there is an extraordinary carbon output. So much, in fact, that you have mining operations in places that have gone full digital, like Estonia, and uh, they have been able to build hydroelectric dams to create enough power to to power mining machines for cryptocurrencies, right? So th these this, this power aspect and how it relates to climate has deep ramifications into everything. The more you start to see these goals in your own life and how they play out as factors, uh, the more you'll see intersectionalities between all kinds of different things. So um, I think we're at the point where I am ready to turn it over to Jay. Uh, and he's going to share with you about Finastra's mentality of how they put these goals into actual practice. Um, but I invite everyone to Google United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you find your way to the UN website uh, for these goals, you can click on any of them. They'll unfold for you and give you all different types of metrics and data. And you can even look up your own country's report. So wherever you may be living, you can pull the report of that country. Some even go down to the province or county, uh, depending on if that data is kind of available and see where you stand. Spoiler alert, there's no country on earth that is doing uh, the goals well enough to be on track to meet the goal, right? Because if you've got goals, what, well, what are they in here? Well, the goal is to bring every country into the green zone for these goals by 2030. So that means that right now in the 2020s has been called the decade of action. And uh, that is what I will leave you with and hope that you all are inspired to do is to get out there and to take action. Thanks so much, Clay. There you I are, think it's, it's really helpful to have a bit of context about what this framework means and how it was developed. And I think it's good to understand, you know, it was developed for, for countries and, and to be put into action at a kind of more governance level. But Jay, I was wondering if you could give us the perspective of a corporate and how a company can take this framework and apply it into um, business strategy. Yeah, thanks, Manny, and, and thanks, Clay, for the partnership over the past few years, all the advice and counsel that you provided to Finastra and the team. Um, you know, just to echo Maddie's um, opening comments regarding the conflict in, in Eastern Europe, you know, we've, we can see here on the slide, SDG number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, you know, we all pray and hope for peace and, and hope that this uh, situation can resolve itself uh, and all the people that are affected by this conflict. Um, can can go back to their normal lives um, as soon as possible. But that being said, I mean, I know everyone here is is joining this call to learn more about how you can make an impact, uh, both for the planet, for prosperity, and for people, through fintech innovation via Finastra's Hackathon. And this is what's really exciting about this conversation and what Clay's just shared, because finance is linked to all of these different um, aspects of the SDGs. Right. If you can, you, everything requires capital for for um, for these changes to happen. Uh, and through this hackathon process, you can come up with an idea that can accelerate progress um, on the, on these goals collectively or individually um, through the innovation that we can create in this ha exciting hackathon that Finastra is putting on for the world. Um, but if we can get to the next slide, Maddie, I think I'm here to talk about. Um, ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. And essentially, it's a map of what Clay just showed us for the world, the global goals, but at a corporate level. So the, the SDGs really spoke to every single stakeholder in the world, governments, corporates, individuals, um, and, and uh, everything in between, right? Um, but ESG is really a company's performance as it, as it pertains to the environment, uh, the society in which it operates and the principles of governance that it um, adopts to ensure that the company is run in an ethically, legally sound way. 
um, that is managing all types of uh, risk and governance considerations. So if I just zoom in on a couple of those pieces, so a company's impact on the environment, um, like Clay gave us a couple of examples about uh, DeFi and, and cryptocurrency and, and how we can do that in a more sustainable way. And really, you know, the environmental pillar of ESG helps companies think about two things, right? Um, one, how can I reduce my environmental impact? As a technology company, Finastra has three main um, contributors to carbon emissions. Those are our offices, our, our places where we work. Um, the travel that we take, mainly air travel, but obviously all types of travel has a, a carbon footprint as well. And then our data centers, we're a technology company, so all our technology is hosted on data centers and there's a digital carbon footprint, right? Because we run those, those technologies on servers and those servers consume electricity the same way um, uh, somebody mining cryptocurrency would consume electricity, right? So those are our main contributors. And we, we're, Maddie and I are constantly thinking uh, with the rest of the organization how we can reduce the, um, the impact of, of, our, um, of our emissions. So for example, switching to renewable energy in our offices um, is one. Um, putting in ways that employees can recycle waste uh, is another. Um, traveling less. Um, you know, choosing airline carriers that have uh, a better um, carbon footprint than others, right? And it is, uh, is other considerations. Moving to cloud efficient um, cloud platforms, um, carbon efficient cloud platforms, I should say, sorry. Um, you know, that's another way instead of, you know, using data centers that plug into grid energy that can be generated by coal and other fossil fuels. If we can go to renewably powered cloud platforms like Microsoft Azure's platform, or Google Cloud, um, you know, this, this mitigates the, uh, um, the, um, the carbon impact. So those are the types of, that's the first aspect of the environmental piece. The second is every business is going to have some kind of carbon emission. I mean, it'd be, it's, it's, um, it's a dream state to think that a business can operate without creating any, um, carbon emissions. Um, so the emissions that we do generate after we've reduced and reduced should always be the first focus area is offsetting, right? And this is where our partnership with ideas for us and clay's um clay's, clay's ideas and, and advice really help finastra uh, shape our, our carbon offsetting agenda um at the moment we're just as finastra we're investing in nature-based solutions so that's essentially tree planting we're very excited about finastra forests that are growing all over the world that we've sponsored um and uh are, are funding um but there are obviously other ways to do carbon offsetting um which uh, clay mentioned a few of them the S or social uh, aspect is really split into two areas. One is, like Kay said, around prosperity, uh, and the other is around people. Right? So what is the company's impact on, on society as it pertains to creating opportunity for people to prosper? And what is a company's role in ensuring fair and equal treatment of people in, in, uh, in all the communities where it operates? Um, and as a fintech, again, we create technology that banks use to um, uh, to manage their, their financial services. And, you know, we can think about some of the impacts uh, that we can make through innovations in fintech to solve for a lot of the challenges there, like um, gender bias or racial bias in, in lending algorithms that may contribute to higher, um, higher interest rates being charged to minority groups or underrepresented groups. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, going forward. And then governance is really how well run the business is, right? So, you know, how diverse is the board of directors, the people that actually own the business, right? Um, that's, a, that's a major contributor there. Are all the employees trained in, in compliance training? Um, do they understand the, um, the obligations and considerations that they need to know about when they're engaging public officials, right? Um, do they, um, have they been trained in anti-harassment um, uh, training, right? Um, do they comply with all the laws in all the countries where they operate? Are they ethically sound, right? Do they pay women and men fairly uh, and equally, right? Um, all of these different uh, types of considerations come under the governance um, side of, of a business. And usually there's a high correlation between all these areas, right? Um, certainly at Finastra, we see lots of uh, connectivity between our environmental, social and governance work. I can get the, the next slide, please, Maddie. So the, I've, I've already alluded to how Finastra approaches this and, and Clay spoke about the triple bottom line already. And that's very much in 
the approach that Finastra takes. Um, so we think about planet prosperity and people as the triple bottom line. And you can see how the E, the S and the G is split up here. Uh, so E obviously aligns to planet, prosperity and people align to the S of the SG and then G and the principles of governance. And we have our three external impact pillars. So our environment mission is our all our work around the planet, um, our story around financial inclusion and you know, helping to provide affordable financial access to the 1.7 billion people who are unbanked today is our story around prosperity. Um, and social equity is um, our story around people. So this is uh, all the work that we do to ensure a fair and just society. Um, and like 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 uh, um, Clay said, we think about the triple bottom line, and this is actually a framework that has been proposed by the World Economic Forum. It's called the Stakeholder Capitalism Framework. So it's still supporting profitable uh, corporate enterprises, right? But with this notion of stakeholder capitalism as opposed to shareholder value, right? So. This is not just about maximizing profit at the expense of paying minimum wage to certain employees or uh, maximizing profit uh, at the expense of polluting the planet. This is about making business decisions and creating strategic business um, initiatives that can positively impact uh, the planet, prosperity for all, and fair and just treatment of people. Uh, and uh, you can see in this slide that Maddie's kindly put up, some of the um, projects that we're, we're um, leading at Finastra. Um, I'll go right to left because I think um, Clay and I are going to talk about the opportunities in the environmental side of, uh, of, of the hackathon for all of you to think about and consider. That is the priority. I think the E of ESG comes first for, um, for a good reason. It is um, what needs to be the priority for everyone. Uh, if we fight for for racial equality, we fight for gender equality, it will all be in vain if the planet is too hot for all of us to live in it. <laughs> right? uh, and and Earth, I keep many ways smi smiling now because I always tell her the Earth will carry on spinning um, if we make if we make it uninhabitable for humans and it will recover and and regenerate itself. But we won't be here. That's uh, the reason why it's so important that everyone focuses on climate action and climate change. Um, on this call as you think about um as you think about your hackathon proposal and what impact it can have for those other p's but certainly the planet clay just before i go into any of these any any comments from you or just on what i just uh, what i just covered yeah i mean <clears throat> it's kind of a reframing of you know wealth itself in, in a way you know having a company that is merely uh economically profitable and is maybe destroying the environment left and right and treating their people like garbage isn't as valuable as it once was uh you know and and that aspect of how people view companies and business and value right is really important you know a company that's a little less profitable but treats its people well pays them a living wage gives them benefits and chances to uh, improve their lives and 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 is responsible for the resources that it utilizes and does its best to perpetuate and even heal uh, that resource chain uh, if they're a resource intensive company. That is real value now. And that changes how people think of them. Just look at the most respected companies on earth, uh, you know, and how people think of them uh, as far as their sustainability and things like that. So important stuff, and uh, you know we're, we're great to uh, see many, many different companies from all walks of industry trying to embody this, uh, including Finastra. So really exciting stuff for the future. Yeah, we've, we've come a, lot, a long way in 50 years, right? The leading economists in the world 50 years ago said that companies should just chase profit. And by doing so, they create jobs and tax revenues, and and that would, um, you know, help society move forward. Um, but we've seen in in the past half century the impact that that's had on the world in terms of, you know, the disparity of wealth, um, you know, the increase in diabetes and other things from sugary products that we we're all consuming all the time, and obviously, most importantly, the damage we've done to the planet. Right. Um, so, uh, but let, let me just unpack a few of these things, right? And let me start right on the on the right hand side of the slide investing in youth because that's something that clay said you know the onus is on young people to go and solve these planetary problems and this uh platform that we've given you with the youth hackathon is re is really um a 
great place to start. You know, we Finastra invest in teaching kids about computer science and the importance of coding um, for their personal lives and their careers. Um, so we, we run those programs, but we also run this hackathon, which gives young people um, the opportunity to come up with ideas to solve some of these um, societal and planetary problems that uh, we've been talking about. Uh, and um, if we go to the, uh, the, it's on the left there, we all know about the challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the workplace and in society. Um, you know, the role of women in the world has improved massively um, you know, since the, the, um, the 1900s where women didn't even have the right to vote. Can you believe that? And now we've got in a position where we've got female leaders around the world uh, in uh, you know, governing uh, countries, which is just amazing to see. But there's so much work to do to get a, a, an equal and fair society. And, um, you know, again, financial services, financial products, um, the financial institutions have a huge role to play uh, in making uh, capital available to women to start businesses and, and, and do uh, wonderful things in, in uh, communities and also on other underrepresented groups, and, uh, ethnic minorities in different, uh, in different communities as well. Um, bias in fintech and, you know, this is something that, um, you know, we, we touched on. There was actually a really good um, proposal from our previous hackathon, um, actually run by our parent company, Vista Equity Partners, um, called Finequal, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. But we identified, um, actually, Manny, if you could just, I know you can just switch to slides. So why don't we just go to that one? So we identified in the US that um, women led businesses had a 33% less, percent less chance of getting an approval for a loan than a male owned business. Now, why is that? Um, you know, that's just completely wrong that that's the case. And that's a bias that was in the trading data that went into those lending algorithms. And we, um, we gave, through Finequal, thanks the opportunity to identify that bias and and, uh, and address it. Um, it's the same, unfortunately, for minorities. So minorities were charged one point four percent more on on business loans than uh, their white counterparts in the U.S. Right? Um, again, why is that the case? Uh, um, and you know, surely there there are some data points that suggest that the risk of default might be higher or uh, among certain demographics, but. That is just that just seems like bias that needs to be addressed, and then you can see that um, you know the amount of money that African American Latinos in the U.S. are paying on mortgages uh, versus their white counterparts, and again, you know this this uh, this is something that the te technology can address first, identify, address, and then solve for, and so Finequal was really um, a hackathon entry in 2020, in the Vista Hackathon that won that hackathon. Um, and so, you know, the reason why I showed this is because I want you to identify a, a societal problem and then think about a, a potential solution. What would that look like? What kind of um, data would it need? What kind of technologies would it need? So for this, we use artificial intelligence, machine learning um, to sort of identify the bias and then compensate for it. Um, so, you know, this is a really great way of thinking about a societal problem, a solution, uh, and then, you know, really mapping out what that solution looks like, feels like, who's the target audience, um, how would they use it, what technologies would it would it leverage, and and, uh, and how would it be deployed? If we can go back to the the master slide, Maddie. So then um, uh, we can talk about financial inclusion. And financial inclusion is a is a big challenge in the world. Um, I mentioned the 1.7 billion people who are unbanked today, um, but there are yeah, probably what seven and a half. I declare you tell me seven and a half, eight billion people in the world, maybe maybe more. Um, a large mm -hmm. are underbanked. All right, so this means that unbanked means you don't have a bank account. Underbanked means you may have a bank account, but you never use it or don't trust financial institutions. Jay, if I if I just may, real quick, some of the work that we do around the world is is really affected by this, and you know we'll we'll fund different kinds of projects in Democratic Republic of the Congo or in um, uh, Liberia and Rwanda, and there in many of these countries there's no debit card system, uh, so that was really wild to experience. Uh, lines of people outside of banks queuing up every morning just to get the equivalency of a few dollars. 
uh, we would convert money and would be carrying, you know, a, a, a manila folder of money, paper money off of just the equivalency of a few hundred dollars US. And it was the carrying and transportation of paper money uh, was fascinating for us to see how as a society they managed that. And uh, even, even now, many of the people we aim to help through a program we have called the Solutions Fund, which funds projects for people that are farthest from sustainability, we have to use technologies like uh, Western Union to send money because the people that we're sending money to have no bank account. So there's nowhere to do a wire transfer to. And then they're going to uh, the, the Western Union shop and picking up a briefcase of money, right? And then having to manage that to launch a, at a particular action project that we're funding. So and pay the fees and, 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 and the fees on both sides as well, right? Exactly. So that this has real world uh, effects here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's projected for this, um, uh, you know, decade is global satellite internet, right? And when you think about what that will do to where there will be nowhere on earth that you cannot have, you know, one of these in your pocket and uh, be able to connect and bank and be part of the world, right? And and to be plugged into the modern world. So fascinating technology uh, on, on the rise. Sounds yeah, like some um, potential kind of uh, problem statements there that could be applied to our hackathon very um, much so yeah, yeah and i so. i noticed we've got a lot of people from you know lots of different places around the world in uh, the audience today and i just want to remind you you can use the questions um buttons if you're watching on linkedin or eventbrite to ask our panelists any questions um but jay yeah. i'll i'll pound up both back to you yeah thanks, thanks money and, and clay really really you know, important points. You know, I studied economics at university in a long time ago now. And uh, I remember they told us that the cost of cash, physical cash to any economy is 6% of the of, of, of GDP, right? So just the printing of money, the amount of money that gets lost, stolen, whatever it is, right? Um, cost, cost an economy 6%. And so if we can digitize all money, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll be creating a massive improvement uh, just just by doing that, um, and that brings me on to, to this financial inclusion pillar. And you know, we um, you know, I firmly believe that before you provide affordable access to financial services, people need to understand how financial services and systems work. So we we invest a lot in financial literacy, providing financial literacy to children, to uh, to students who are about to take a student loan to fund their college education or university education, um, and also small business owners, um, providing them with uh, access to financial literacy to understand. What is a credit score? What is the impact of their credit score of not paying loans back on time uh, or defaulting on a loan completely? Um, and then we've got initiatives like the trust machine and what we're doing in the US uh, with uh, the SMEs, the SMB market and lending, and then uh, our partnership with International Chamber of Commerce and, and our Tradecom solution. But, um, uh, you know, one of the really exciting projects that came out of the youth hackathon last year was from a slum in uh, Kenya, in a place called Matare. Um, there was a, 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 a financial, uh, not financial, an education um, uh, institution called MUMO. Um, that is a, a center for, for, for um, young people and orphans um, who are studying there. And they basically joined the hackathon and came up with this idea called SBOB, the SBOB SACO, an app. And so I don't know if anybody knows what a SACO is. Essentially, it's just this way you word for credit union. But you know, these credit unions are essentially somebody with a physical ledger that they write all the sort of uh, debts of the different members in. And then they have a physical safety deposit box with cash in it, with a padlock on it. And the trustees of the, of the, of the SACO have the keys, right? Now, to Clay's point, if you've got physical cash in a box, right, and it's not in the... the the banking world and digital currency, that money is not doing anything. It's just depreciating in line with inflation, right? If we can get that money into the financial system, that can create collateral that can then be used to create loans for people to go and start new businesses, expand in, in, in existing businesses, go and create jobs, which will give people livelihoods, right? So we're talking about no poverty, no hunger, those uh, SDGs. Right, a decent work and, and uh, economic growth. 
this is exactly uh, in line with that. And, you know, credit to the children for coming up with this. But they were telling us that the majority of people in the slum live on less than a dollar a day. A lot of the time, their physical money gets, you know, lost, gets taken by rats sometimes. Um, you know, we heard all sorts of horrific stories about how people lose money. Um, and, you know, they came up with this idea for this digital credit union to, to exist that could do a number of things. So one, provide financial literacy on the platform via the smartphone. Two, enable peer-to-peer -peer payments without uh, any fee for like lo very low cost transactions. So, you know, they got something called M-Pesa in, in, in Kenya, which was fantastic in terms of an innovation, but they do charge high fees and you don't get a return on investment for uh, the balances that you have with M-Pesa. So this, you know, so this digital credit union would make that, make those peer-to-peer -peer payments free and don't make any savings that are held by uh, members of the SACO um, have a return on, on, that, on that saving. It also enables um, what they call a shama, which is a group saving. So this would be, you know, Clay, myself and Maddie all putting in together into a fund. And if Clay was having a hard month, he could go and dip into that fund uh, and, pay, um, and, and pay that money back with a little bit of interest and make it uh, interesting for Maddie and myself. And that can, that can extend to, you know, your friend network, but with the digital version of that, you can expand that and scale it, right? Which is really, really exciting. Um, and then we also um, thought about a marketplace, right? So in the slum, you've got people, let's say a chicken farmer selling eggs, right? He sells eggs to the people in and around his, um, his hut, right? But if you can, if you can put those eggs on a, on an app and, uh, and put a price on it and it can be paid in digital currency, um, then anybody in the slum can buy his, uh, his eggs and he can, you know, use that, use the profits to invest in more chickens, get more eggs and hire more people to go deliver them right so we're creating uh, so this um this uh proposal from these children um I'm, I'm ashamed to say it but it actually was the runner-up it wasn't even the best uh, considered to be the best solution uh last year in the youth hackathon but it was one that finash has taken forward in and invested into to actually turn this into a uh product which we're now um in discussions with several clients in kenya to support uh, and partners such as uh, KPMG. So this is, um, you know, really, really exciting, and um, you know, just hopefully gives you some inspiration into um, what you could be doing uh, to solve some of these problems that we've uh, spoken up about up front, and how technology can solve for it. Um, I think maybe we can get rid of the slides now and just have a, a conversation. Sure. For we actually, um, we actually have a relevant question, so I'm going to go ahead and ask that. Um, we're going to pose that to you, um, Jay, and then Clay, if you want to jump in and give some examples, potentially from your work and projects with um, that you've been doing in the DRC. Um, but the question is, do developing countries experience the same effects of inflation? Um, and that's from Megan. So thanks for your question, Megan. Yeah, thanks for the question, Megan. No such thing as a silly question, right? So please do keep questions coming in. Um, but yes, they do. And, and in a big, big way. Right. So, you know, if you don't have a bank account and your money is not in a bank account generating even a little bit of interest. Right. It's just depreciating in cash in your hands as you hold it. Right. Um, and typically the inflation rates in developing countries are much higher than they are in the developed world. So, um, you know, uh, it's I would say those people are really affected by it, but because they don't understand what inflation is and how it affects their personal wealth, um, you know, they um, they don't have a solution for it. Uh, and this is where, you know, innovations like SBOB Digital Credit Union can um, can help solve for that because we do give um, members of that credit union a, a return on, on, the, on the savings that they keep with this, with this echo. But great question, Megan. Thank you for it. Um, Clay, I think you're on mute. If you I want was to muted. Jump Sorry. <laughs> Just to jump in there real quick. Uh, 2016, okay, I remember uh, talking with some of my African friends about Zimbabwe's uh, $100 trillion bill. And uh, if you Google that, the Zimbabwe $100 trillion bill uh, came out in, in, in 2016, and of course, due to incredible inflation 
in their country and uh, just destabilizing everything with their currency and them needing to print higher and higher denominations uh, of bills to combat this aspect of people carrying around so much money. Uh, so especially places that have had fragile democracies, right, tend to have a lot of fluctuation with their currency. Uh, things can affect currency like uh, even uh, resource intensive operations coming in, mining operations, oil drilling, uh, you know, look at things like uh, Nigeria, right, the wealthiest country in all of Africa, and so wealthy because of their massive oil reserves, right? So um, really uh, important to understand that, uh, you know, your kind of larger Western influenced currencies and um, countries, uh, you know, though can certainly have all kinds of things happen, tend to be pretty stable, even though we're facing three to 7% in, uh, inflation here uh, in the United States right now, for instance, right? It, that's three to 7% is still the highest in 25 years, right? As far as inflation goes. So, uh, you know, we've got some stability here in, in, in the West. So fascinating stuff to look at globally. Thanks, yeah, decentralized Craig. finance is, uh, is another thing, right? So whether you're a fan of crypto or not, I mean, we've seen what's happened um, as to the Russian currency as a result of um, the conflict with Ukraine. And, you know, the currency is depreciating massively, um, which means that, you know, Bitcoin, um, which you know, lost a lot of market value uh, over the past six to 12 months, got an appreciation of around 20, 20% overnight, because obviously people with rubles were switching that to crypto, right? Uh, and that moved the market. Um, so, you know, whether you're a fan of crypto or not, that is uh, you know, sometimes in a, an escape mechanism to avoid uh, depreciation and inflation considerations for uh, asset And holders. interestingly, um, decentralized finance is another theme for our hackathon this year. Um, and there are some other series that we've done that focus on decentralized finance if you want to go back and have a look at um, those sessions in our audience. We have an interesting question from Shireen that kind of, I guess, puts together the two themes. Um, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, Clay, first, and then I'll go to Jay, uh, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. So do you have any thoughts on how decentralized finance or NFTs, non-fungible tokens, can support with the sustainable development goals and climate challenges? Yeah, of course. So, you know, again, these are, these are essentially things that have value, right? Both perceived value and, um, you know, value in, uh, you know, the amount of uh, work that maybe an algorithm is doing, right? Anything of value can be traded or repurposed uh, in a way where it can benefit philanthropy or it can be benefit different kinds of projects. I think the first thing to think about is making sure that the, the actions that you're doing to create the NFT or to, to utilize a blockchain technology isn't doing more, more harm than good, right? So certainly focusing around how can we power these things, um, you know, in, in, a, in a way where you're using renewable energy, how can you make sure that the rollout of them is equitable, right? And that um, you're making them available to, uh, you know, everyone freely, right? So having, having that kind of, um, uh, aspect and, and I think that that's definitely part of decentralized things in general, right? That kind of mentality of sharing and open source and transparency and all of those types of things. But I think using NFTs, especially from an artistic standpoint, to um, you know not just create art and the sale of that, uh, but to also have as an outlet for creativity. I think that we'll see NFTs evolving over this next decade to be thought of not necessarily as a file, but more of an of a of a of a symbolizer of an object. And when those kinds of things open up, then you've got NFTs that can be maybe used for solar credits or paying an electricity bill, or as a, a currency in a transaction. Uh, and you're trading a digital file, right? That can't be fungible. Right, because it's a non-fungible token, right? Which is what NFTs stand for, and um, the future will be, you know, trading that like any other object for something else, you know, and uh, having that something else maybe have a real-world value. Uh, so it's really amazing to see how those things have transformed over the years, for sure. 
Thanks, Chloe. Do you, do you have anything to add, Jay? Um, I saw we have another interesting question that's come in, which kind of touches on this, um, from Niladri on YouTube. Um, and, and you touch on this, Clay. Um, crypto mining is now becoming one of the major concerns of global warming due to its very high energy intensive consumption. Um, and are there any technologies in the field that are going to try and tackle that? Jay, yeah. You, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, look, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm not a, uh, just to not uh, skirt past um, Shireen's question on DeFi and NFTs. I mean, I've just found yeah. out what NFTs are from uh, my younger colleagues at Finastra um, and decentralized finance. I've, um, I've, uh, um, you know, I know a little bit about, but I, I you know, I, what I, I'm conscious of you know, how much time we've got and the people on the, on, on the audience. I just wanted to tell them about what I feel is the biggest way to accelerate progress against climate uh, challenges with, as it pertains to fintech and financial services. And that is really with green finance, right? Um, and I'll get to your question in a second, Andrew, but, um, Green, just in case anybody doesn't know, so green finance, sustainable finance, impact finance, um, ESG finance is um, money that investors put on the table to go and um, go and, uh, and create impact in the world as it pertains to planet people prosperity, right? Uh, green finance is specifically uh, on environmental programs. And there are, you know, Maddie, myself and Clay were all at COP26 in Glasgow last November. Um, it was the first time we met Clay in person, actually, there. And, um, you know, we, I mean, Maddie and I certainly heard from so many different corporates who are doing things in a sustainable way. Um, so we heard from a green steel manufacturer. We heard from um, a company that is um, produced technology called Endrip, which is moving um, agriculture away from flood farming techniques. You know, these are really massive uh, uh, improvements in the ways of we've of things that we've done for so long uh, in the same way that have caused the problems that we've spoken about. Um, but they require capital, they require investment, right? Um, and a lot of the time, these sustainable ways of doing things carry what we call a green premium, right? And green finance, sustainable finance and impact finance can all be allocated to um, to, to fund these uh, sustainable ventures. And, you know, with the reduced cost of financing can can actually negate that uh, that green premium. Right, so you know, I'd really love everyone on the on the call to think about the opportunity there because banks are trying to figure this out as well. You know, some of the progressive banks are already there. So Climate First Bank, um, the co-founder of Ideas for Us, is is a board member there, and um, you know they've they, they've got their head around this, but a lot of the leading financial institutions haven't. So if you're thinking about a way to really make an impact on on the planet and and accelerate uh, climate action um, through finance, that's a that's a really um, really smart way to do it uh, if we could figure out how we help um, consumers corporates make more sustainable green choices with the with the funding that they can get through loans from banks uh, to, to go and make those uh, environmental impacts but um, Nalandri to your question uh, you know really it's about not having those servers that you're mining crypto on plugged into the grid and if you are if they are plugged into the grid making sure that the the amount of um, fossil fuel generated energy is at a, as a, at a minimum. A lot of people don't even look at these percentages from the utility providers, but you need to, right? Um, if there's an app that we can create that can show people that, right? Like what I'm using British gas in the UK or I'm using, you know, something else somewhere else. How, what percentage of British gas's energy is renewable powered, right? Um, should I be looking for a, you know, to use server space on a, on a, cloud, on a carbon efficient cloud platform like uh, Azure or Google Cloud? Which will actually be a much more environmentally friendly way of, um, you know, mining crypto if that's what I'm, I'm doing on a on a day to day basis. Right? So that, that's my uh, two pence there. But I'll hand over to Clay because I'm sure he's got some thoughts too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that I think is so important is to realize that, you know. Uh, the reason that certain cryptocurrencies or certain um, blockchain activities are more energy intensive than others is because of how much computing power is needed to solve the algorithmic puzzle. And then once the computer is working really hard, you know, with its hard drives going, they used to spin, now they're solid state, they don't spin anymore. But before you could, you know, hear a computer when it would really ramp up the processing power that it was doing. And um, 
you know, that is what is so energy intensive. So for starters, you want to, in those who are creating new cryptocurrencies still today, you want to use algorithms that uh, select for proof of uh, stake instead of proof of work. And then you also want to have algorithms that are inherently low mathematically intensive and um, to cut down on computing power. Then you want to make sure whatever kind of power you are utilizing is powered by renewable resources, right? Uh, or, or energy that is at least non-carbon intensive and non-climate changing uh, molecule intensive, right? So natural gas would be a no-no, right? People like to tote natural gas as being highly beneficial because it doesn't have carbon in it, right? Uh, at the same levels as coal does, for instance. But in, in that case, you're burning uh, methane, right? And this is a much larger, more climate-inducing chemical uh, in the atmosphere molecule than uh, you have with uh, carbon dioxide being combusted. Right. So it's worse for global warming, uh, but people will tout it as low carbon and they're correct in that statement. Right. But it's, again, kind of how this uh, language can be twisted around from the, the real uh, the real solution here. So, uh, yeah, so selecting towards algorithms that are inherently uh, non uh labor intensive, powering off of renewable energy, making sure that these types of things are equitable uh, and available to people to utilize. That's what's key. Thank you both for such a eloquently put answer to both those, those questions. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, I think a great question to end on um, to to and, and maybe you can give your kind of roundup and final thoughts um, whilst you answer this, but what are some resources um, that people might want to see when wanting to learn a little bit more about the SDGs or ESG? Um, and, and Jay, I'll ask you first. Yeah, so I said that we were aligned to the World Economic Forum Stakeholder Capitalism Framework. The World Economic Forum is a fantastic uh, you know, um, place to, to sort of, well, a website that, that they have has got fantastic resources where you can learn all about stakeholder capitalism, where you they they actually um, you can if you follow them on LinkedIn, I see a lot of people have joined via LinkedIn today. They're always putting out you know different countries' approach, different corporates' approach to um, solving environmental and, and social challenges that we're facing. Um, I think they for me they are um, doing it with the right spirit. Um, I know it's got its critics, particularly you know um, the the uh, some some people in the US are not bought in on on the WEF, but I can assure you that um, the International Business Council, so the largest companies in the world, which includes some of the largest asset management companies in the world and and the top four consulting firms, uh, have all bought into WEF. So I would say that's a great place to go to learn more about ESG and the roles of corporates as it pertains to the SDG. Thanks, Jay, um, and and Clay. Any ideas about where to go, find out more about the SDGs, maybe find out more about what ideas for us are doing? Yeah, of course. So uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, utilizing Google, of course, right, to, to do searches and to learn more about these things, right? Certainly see videos that people are creating about these topics online. Uh, YouTube as well is a great resource for these types of things. Uh, you know, when you're trying to learn about sustainability or the sustainable development goals, right? Uh, don't just read articles, right? We live in a place where people who are experts are able to create multimedia educational pieces about things. And uh, you really want to kind of expose yourself to a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different discussions and, and firsthand accounts of people who work on these things. One that I highly recommend is Ideas for Us and visiting our website, which you can find at ideasforus.org because we are an organization, right? So .org. And um, that is a great portal to learn more about us, of course. Social media is really where we do a lot of our posting of what we're doing and communicating with our audience and talking about the action projects and showing the work that we do. And uh, Facebook and LinkedIn are great places to find us. So just type in ideas for us. We have a blue check. Uh, next to us on Facebook, and uh, that's our official page. And then we also have Ideas for Us pages for uh, many of the different countries that we're in. 
And so there's going to be an ideas for us Liberia, and ideas for us Nepal, and ideas for us Romania, and ideas for us Rwanda, and so on and so on. So uh, check those out. They're, they're a great way to see what this work looks like in practice, right? And uh, I think that that is really important to kind of open your mind and expose yourselves to and to see how you can get involved, uh, or at least live these types of uh, goals uh, by where you choose to be employed and how you choose to shop and how you choose to live your life. And I think that if we all did that, we'd be in a much better world. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, and thanks to our audience for listening along. Some of the key takeaways that I've taken from today is that there are a lot of really complex challenges facing us as humanity. Um, you know, ranging from climate change to the geopolitical issues that are facing us um, very, very much recently. Um, and there are lots of different kind of solutions and things that are coming up in terms of finance, um, such as defense centralized finance, that could be a solution to some of these problems. But we really need to take a multifaceted approach to when we're looking at these solutions and make sure that through decentralized finance, we're not trading off um, our climate. And that's why I want to tie it back to the SDGs and why they're such a good framework for looking at all new innovations, because it's important, um, you know, the frameworks were developed so that we don't forget about any of these issues and that we we approach all these um, issues in one go. Um, and that's what we tried to do at Finastra within our ESG team and very much what Ideas for Us is doing as well. Um, so please, everyone, feel free to connect with myself, with Clay, with Jay, um, and join our next session. So tomorrow there's a session on banking as a service, and we'll actually continue the discussion on the sustainable development goals and sustainable finance on Thursday the 10th um, with a talk um, on circular economy, and we'll be joined again by Jay and myself. Um, and check all the hackathon and information and events um, on finastra.com forward slash hacks the future. Thanks a lot, Jay and Clay, and thank you, everyone. I'll see you soon.